Unit 13, Section 3, Fungi in the Environment. So what good are the fungi? Well, first and foremost, fungi are primary decomposers. That is, they break down organic matter and, to an extent, even inorganic matter, such as rocks, into nutrients for themselves and for other organisms in the environment. Simply put, without fungi, the earth could not support life. And it's been said if we didn't have fungi um, in a year, the world would be neck deep in dead leaves and grass. Um, they perform a vital function in breaking down things like uh, lignin and, and cellulose, or, or what we call wood, um, that other organisms have difficulty uh, doing any uh, break down work on and fungi can actually decompose those break them down into simpler uh, compounds which can then be more easily broken down by other decomposers like uh, bacteria and things like that <clears throat> fungi also provide food for other organisms quite a bit of food for different organisms um, all the way from bacteria and other fungi up to people, they also provide us with uh, drugs that we use, um, such as penicillin. So they have a uh, purpose in the environment. Fungi are not plants, but they often will form relationships with plants uh, in the form of something called mycorrhiza. Mycorrhiza is a sort of a combination word coming from uh, myco, which means uh, mushrooms or fungi, and rhiza, which uh, is the root word for roots, uh, plant roots. So the fungi, mycelia, will enter plant roots, and rather than causing disease or problem by entering the roots, they provide the plant with a better ability to absorb water and minerals because the fungal mycelia have an extremely high surface area and they can absorb all these minerals and water and things from the soil um, in a volume that the plants might not be able to do or couldn't do on their own. Um, the plants then draw those minerals and uh, water out of the fungi through the process of osmosis um, but in exchange, the fungi has access to a much more consistent supply of carbohydrates in the form of glucose and sucrose and fructose and sugars made by the plant that the fungi can use. It's a relationship that benefits both. Then, when a plant dies, either if it's an annual plant at the end of the year and the end of its life cycle, or if it's a perennial plant and something happens to it, a tree struck by lightning or something like that, fungi in the soil break it down into its constituent parts and return those nutrients to the soil, and where those nutrients can be used by other organisms, other plants, other fungi, other bacteria. Fungal mycelia also help hold soil particles together and help prevent soil erosion. And as they grow through the soil, they can make changes and adjustments in soil pH, typically adjusting pH into a range that's more hospitable for plant growth, and add plants or add nutrients that plants need. Let's take a little closer look at uh, the mycorrhiza association. There are three broad categories of mycorrhiza. The ectomycorrhiza, which grow in the area on the plant roots and in the soil around a plant root. They don't typically penetrate really deeply into the plant root, but they do penetrate some. The endomycorrhiza penetrate quite deeply into a plant's roots and extend fairly far out into the soil surrounding the roots. And then the aracoid mycorrhiza live inside the outermost layer of plant roots, uh, the cells of plant roots, but don't extend uh, very far into the surrounding soil. 
Uh, this photograph shows the ectomycorrhiza, which are the white masses growing on spruce roots, which are the brownish masses. So you can see here a spruce root and all of this white mass surrounding it is fungal. And this is a positive association for the spruce. And in fact, there are plants which cannot survive without the associated microorganisms in the soil. Uh, an endangered lady slipper orchid, which is a uh, temperate zone North American um, woodland orchid, for instance, requires an association of uh, mycorrhiza in order to survive. How about fungi and humans? Well, we've seen fungi such as uh, morels and truffles um, or uh, giant puffballs used as food. Some other fungi, including the Amanita uh, mushroom that we saw earlier, the uh, reddish orange one, um, are poisonous. And yet other fungi, uh, such as penicillium, provide useful medicines, such as penicillin. Fungi can also repel and kill insects, such as termites and carpenter ants. Newer research is showing that certain fungi can break down very complex hydrocarbons, uh, such as oil or diesel fuel or gasoline, into uh, harmless constituent compounds. In addition, fungi may be the key in making ethanol from cellulose, which is plant waste like wood chips and grass clippings. Currently, ethanol is only made in quantity by uh, fermenting um, plant parts or plant oils um, or plant sugars that are high in sugar. So we need to use the corn, the ear of corn. We need to use soybeans. We need to use sugar cane to generate um, large quantities of ethanol. Um, fungi may actually be the key to allowing us to use what we currently think of as waste products, such as grass clippings and wood chips and things like that, um, to generate ethanol. The fungi could break these things down um, into uh, simpler compounds, including sugars, that the yeasts, which do the fermenting and the manufacturing of the ethanol, can then work on. Um, here's a, a photo micrograph of some stained uh, penicillium fungi, and it's this fungi that produces a compound that uh, is antibiotic, which kills certain bacteria and provides valuable medicine for us. Uh, another uh, interesting relationship of fungi in the environment is something called lichens. Lichens are a partnership or another symbiotic relationship, sort of like the mycorrhiza with plant roots. Lichens are a symbiotic relationship of a fungus and an algae, or a fungus and a cyanobacterium. The algae grows inside the fungus or the bacteria and is therefore uh, protected from the environment, from drying out, from the wind, uh, and from extremes. Uh, in the climate, the algae that lives inside is able to photosynthesize something a fungi can't do. Fungus have no uh, ability to photosynthesize, no chlorophyll. So the algae that lives inside these fungi um, photosynthesize and make food. And they make food in excess of what they themselves need, and so they provide extra carbohydrates to the fungus. It's a symbiotic relationship. Lichens are colonizers. Um, and they often colonize environments where other organisms can't survive, such as high mountains. Lichens grow on the surface of rocks. That helps uh, provide small windbreaks, um, which catch particles of uh, 
uh, mineral uh, bits of rocks and things as they blow by in the wind or carry by in water. Um, that's a beginning step in the process of creating soil. What lichens can also do, though, is because of the um, sort of acids and, and other molecules that they excrete through the cells, they can actually cause the breakdown of rocks. And that breaking down of rocks, that creating of small windbreaks, that soil building process all makes it possible then for more evolved plants possibly to start growing in the area. Now there's some soil, at least a little bit, that they can get roots into. Now animals can move into the area because they have plants and things to eat. Lichens make all that possible. Lichens grow in three forms. The first is called crustose, and you'll notice something similar in all these names. Um, crustose lichens form a crust-like layer on the surfaces on which they grow, whether it's a rock or a um, piece of wood or whatever. The fruticose lichens are taller and have a lot of branches. They're not necessarily leaf-like or plant-like, but uh, taller and branched. Foliose lichens, however, are much more leaf-like in their appearance, and some varieties can grow vertically, though most of them grow horizontally or flat. Um, this is a picture of a crustose lichen growing on a tree trunk, and you can see um, this lichen here, which is surrounded by the pink outer layer, and then a little bit of pink and the other grayish color inside. Um, what may not be immediately obvious is that up here, this light color, this green color over here, this sort of bluish green color down here, these are also crustose lichens growing on this tree trunk. This is a fruticose lichen, sometimes referred to as uh, reindeer moss, that sort of thing. Um, growing up, branching out, sort of a tubular stem-like growth to it without any real uh, leaves. Once again, they're not plants. They're an association of, of fungi and an algae. And this is the foliose lichen, where these individual structures tend to look like leaves. So are the fungi all good? Unfortunately, no. As most plant diseases and many human diseases are caused by fungi. And some fungi can destroy millions of dollars worth of crops each year. As a primary decomposer, fungi can cause decay and rot in things like buildings and bridges. Uh, anything made of wood uh, can be broken down by fungi. Uh, things such as dry rot are caused by fungi. There are some interesting fungi out there. This particular one is called cedar apple rust. Um, you can see this background. This is a cedar tree. Here's the stem of the tree. And this structure growing on it is a cedar apple rust gall. What happens is um, it infects, as the name implies, cedar apple rust. It infects cedar trees and apple trees alternating between the two. Um, it infects the cedar trees in the fall, and then in the, and it grows this large gall-like structure. You notice these protrusions from it. This starts happening in springtime, that it gets these orange protrusions that are 
crusty looking but generally a fairly bright orange color. When the uh, temperature and humidity, when the weather is correct, these structures grow extremely fast and can hang very far down from the main gall itself and in fact will simply cover it and they turn gelatinous looking like say orange marmalade um, long tubules of orange marmalade um, pretty much as good as a flower on a cedar tree and uh, they do very little harm to the cedar tree uh, cause a little damage right where they're attached to the stem but usually nothing that causes any distress for the cedar tree once these long gelatinous masses called telial horns uh, are hanging down um, they produce spores the spores then are windborne and blow from these structures onto apple trees crab apple trees hawthorn trees things like that in the springtime right as those plants are beginning to flower as they're starting to flower, those flowers provide openings for the fungal, fungal spores to get inside the plant. Um, once they're inside the plant, they grow in the leaves and they grow in the fruits of the apple trees, causing um, rust-like spots on the leaves and often on the fruits themselves. Um, on apples, the effect is largely cosmetic. It can make them look really bad. It can make them lose their leaves. Um, very early in the season, earlier than they normally would, but um, usually doesn't kill the tree. Uh, it can do damage to the fruit, but all in all, it's an organism that has exquisite timing in leaving the apple tree and getting to the cedar tree in time to uh, infect it during the damp fall and then leaving the cedar tree and getting to the apple tree in time to infect that during the damp spring. Um, and there are quite a few fungi that live on two different hosts like this. Uh, Dutch elm disease is another plant disease that's caused by a fungi. Um, however, the fungi that causes Dutch elm disease needs some help to get into the plant. It can't do it on its own. Now, contrary to the name, the trees infected aren't Dutch elms. They're actually American elms. The disease itself is not from Holland. It's from Asia. But the organism was first identified by a Dutch scientist, so that's where the name came from, Dutch elm disease. The fungus is spread by an insect called the elm bark beetle. As I said, it needs help to get inside the tree. What happens is there's a tree that's infected, the elm bark beetle um, will, the female will lay her eggs on the tree, on the tree bark. When the larvae hatch out, they immediately chew into the, through the bark, into the cambium or that um, vascular area between the bark and the tree uh, interior wood then they feed in what are called galleries. They chew their, so themselves long tunnels and they branch out as different larvae from the eggs being laid um, go in different directions inside the tree. As they do this, they pick up that fungus in their guts. They then pupate, turn into mature beetles, chew their way out of the tree, fly to another elm tree to lay their eggs, and the process gets repeated, and then the process spreads the fungus. You can see here a tree that looks primarily healthy, but you can see this branch here starting to die because the vascular system of the tree has been clogged up with so much fungus that it can no longer move nutrients up or sugars down and that branch of the tree will die. Once you see this happening on a tree, um, the entire tree is probably doomed at that point. Um, this disease was introduced into the U.S. It didn't exist here um, in the early 1900s and eventually killed over 90% of American elm trees 
in the United States. Here we see the feeding galleries of elm bark beetles. You can see the uh, central gallery and then the branches as the individual larvae move out into the tree. And it's this feeding that picks up the uh, fungus in the gut of the larvae and then allows them, when they mature, to spread it to another tree. There are other plant fungal diseases. There are actually hundreds, if not thousands, of uh, relatively common plant diseases which are caused by fungus. But some of them that are of major concern right now are sudden oak wilt, which causes apparently healthy oaks to start wilting and die often within a single season. Anthracnose, a disease which can survive in the soil once uh, uh, diseased bits of wood have fallen to the soil, the anthracnose can survive there. Black knot, a disease of cherries. Apple scab, of course, a disease of apples, and many, many more.